Uh, uh, thank you for the invite. Um, I'll go through a, a brief history of uh, policing uh, in the north of Ireland. Um, the uh, police force was called the Royal Ulster Constabulary, and it was set up at partition uh, when Ireland was divided in 1921. And uh, the government at the time said that it was a Protestant parliament for a Protestant people. So at the beginning, uh, they said what type of, uh, of uh, parliament, what type of government it was going to be. The RUC then was uh, composed of something like 95% Protestant or pro-British. And uh, uh, um, there was very few uh, uh, Catholics in it. They became the frontline troops. Um, in the, they were heavily armed. They were a paramilitary force. They were very partisan. They were a political force. So they were, they were set up specifically not to be a police service, uh, but to maintain uh, the link with Britain and uh, to suppress uh, Irish nationalism. So when it came to the negotiations to jump very far forward after uh, a long conflict uh, in uh, 19, uh, the 1990s, into the negotiations which I was a part of and I would have been central to the policing aspect of those negotiations, then it was has been described as policing itself almost as big as the other issues involved. It was a huge issue because this was the frontline troops. Uh, there was a huge amount of uh, animosity between them and the uh, nationalist community. Uh, so in negotiations, uh, we weren't able, <coughs> we were able to come to agreement in 1998 on uh, many things, but on policing we could not get agreement with the pro-British uh, unionists at the time. So what was agreed was that the agreement would go ahead, but that an international commission would be set up, which became known as the Patent Commission. There was a number of international figures in it from America, Australia, from Britain, and uh, um, Canada. And they would come back with recommendations on the reform of um, the police uh, as it was then. They did come back to our surprise in 1999 with 175 recommendations. And even from a Republican point of view and a nationalist point of view, they were uh, very radical um, recommendations. So we give it uh, a guarded welcome, what happened then. And some of the key issues, if I could explain on it, is, uh, for instance, one of the, the uh, um, recommendations was 50-50 recruitment. So when they were going to recruit into uh, the organization, uh, for every uh, non-Catholic, non there would be a Catholic recruited to try and build up a critical mass to change the culture, because we, we could have the legislation, but you needed to change the culture within that organization. There was other issues which were perhaps symbolic, but very uh, difficult to, uh, to bring forward. For instance, the change, changing the name of the organization, uh, changing the badge, uh, the uniform, all of that. But the most important uh, issues were around accountability. So we set up a number within these uh, recommendations. And I have to say that when I, mean, I was involved in this, it took six years because the recommendations were very good. But translating the recommendations into actual legislation was opposed by the establishment, by people who had been in the police, uh, all of that, uh, which stretched it out for a period of six years till we eventually got uh, a situation where Sinn Féin decided that they could sign up to the new policing uh, structures. But the main accountability mechanisms, and there are a number, is the policing board. I am now a member of the policing board. It is uh, made up of uh, civilians. There are a number of political appointees from all the assembly parties, the parties in the uh, parliament there. Uh, of, there's 19 members of it. Ten of them are political. Sinn Féin has three members on, of which I am, I am one. Um, there are also nine independent members taken from civic society. And our job and our power is actually to be able to hold the police to account, not to interfere with their day-to-day -day, uh, independence, but when they do something wrong or if we think they're doing something wrong or if there is a difficulty in policy, uh, we are in charge of their budget, for instance, then we will have a view on that. Uh, the other key uh, accountability mechanism was a police ombudsman 
the police are now not able to investigate themselves. Uh, if there is an investigation which involves uh, police misconduct, which involves, for instance, uh, using uh, plastic bullets or live rounds, or any incident which is brought forward by uh, the civilian population, a complaint against the police, then the ombudsman has to handle it. The police have no power uh, to handle that. And the ombudsman has very uh, strong powers to be able to... Uh, uh, to do that. Another uh, accountability mechanism is the Criminal Justice Inspectorate. This is an organization which, is, which it's, does what it says. Uh, it, if it wants to inspect any aspect of the criminal justice system, so it's not just policing, but it involves policing as well, then they can come in and make an inspection and uh, make uh, recommendations, and that's a fairly powerful organization as well. There was also already an, existent, an existence within the, the British jurisdiction, um, an inspector of constabulary. Uh, so that group in, there is a person in charge, but they can come in uh, as well and have done so on occasion. Alongside that, we have an assembly, uh, within the assembly of the parliament, we have a justice committee, which is not specific to policing, but is, deals with all issues of, uh, of justice. And then on top of that, we have the audit office, which can come in uh, to investigate. So there are very, within legislation, there are very powerful organizations which can come in and were set up to make sure that the policing service, as opposed to a police force, could not return to the type of activities and non-accountability and the type of abuse of power that had been there, especially during the conflict. Uh, but even outside of conflict, uh, it, was, it was used. As I said earlier, the establishment fought those uh, recommendations. Every single recommendation, what they tried to do between it being a, a powerful recommendation and putting it into legislation, was they tried to take out the, the power of the recommendation. So that's why the negotiation lasted so long. We had to fight on nearly every recommendation. And, and you must expect that because there are people who were loyal to the old, uh, to the old regime. Our position had always been that it needed to be a, we didn't want a Republican police force. We didn't want a nationalist police force. We wanted a police service, which would serve every single individual, whatever their politics or non-politics was, whatever their religion was, uh, race or, uh, or gender. We wanted a civilian uh, um, police service, which was non-political, which was non-partisan, and most importantly, which was representative of the uh, community. In other words, that it could not be all um, from the... Protestant or the pro-British uh, or Unionist side, or indeed from the Nationalist side. At the moment, we have the, the intent and pattern in bringing in 50-50 recruitment, which of course is positive discrimination. Uh, the intent was to bring the, uh, the Nationalist aspect uh, or critical mass up to 30%. At the moment, it sits at about 31%. Uh, one of the other aspects of it, uh, incidentally, was that it actually increased the gender balance as well, uh, because there were very few women in the RUC and now within the PSNI, which is the new name, the police service of, of Northern Ireland, uh, there is now 28% uh, uh, women involved as well. So it had a positive effect in terms, of, uh, in terms of that. There was also a huge review at the same time of the judicial system. Uh, so. There was a, an independent ju judicial appointments panel put up, um, which would uh, <coughs> they would have to go through a panel to become uh, uh, the judiciary. And the, we, we have a system there now because of the Good Friday Agreement, which is uh, the office, uh, it's now called the executive office, the first minister and deputy first minister. So you have a nationalist, which is uh, Martin McGuinness at the moment, and a pro-British unionist, which is Arlene Foster, who are joint first ministers. So any decision that is made they have to agree on it. Uh, it. It can be very cumbersome, but in terms of our history and the history of the north of Ireland, that was very necessary. They appoint together, they appoint the Attorney General, and they also appoint the Police Ombudsman to make sure that there is agreement on who would do that job. And uh, the Attorney General then appoints the Director of Public Prosecutions because that was a difficulty in the past as well. It, this, this was a huge difficulty for Republicans uh, because of the history of conflict, uh, because of you know, the history going right back to 1921. 
And when we went out to our base to explain to them that, you know, there was a new dispensation, that there was a new police service, that uh, um, that really we needed policing, we did what was what we call town hall meetings. So we went out to every sort of small town or village and we explained why we were changing our position of absolute opposition because you know, um, my history was I was in the IRA. Um, during the conflict, we fought uh, militarily against the uh, police uh, that were there at that time. So, to, so saying to people after coming through that process is this is a new police service that is there for all the people and we need to, uh, we need to support it. It was very difficult, uh, so we took it to every uh, possible area that we could to have that debate, not just to say to them, but to have meetings like this, which would be absolutely packed because of the issue, and listen to the criticism and, and argue it out with the people. Because we couldn't bring it through uh, one of our conferences, we couldn't actually pass it within Sinn Féin without the support of the people. And that eventually happened in 2007, which was really uh, eight years after the Patent Commission came in. So it was, it was quite uh, a long process. The unionists then, ironically, once that was agreed, once nationalism signed up to it and republicanism, <clears throat> the pro-British unionists then said that they did not want that power, the power of policing, transferred away from Westminster and London to the local assembly. And it took uh, another negotiation uh, and, uh, and four years, sorry, three years, till 2010 to get the power actually transferred to a justice minister. And one of the issues that the unionists were worried about was that a Republican, and especially a Republican who had been involved in the conflict, uh, could become the justice minister. And uh, they were afraid that I might become the justice minister. So we came to a compromise, uh, which is that the nationalists would not take the justice ministry and the unionists would not take the justice ministry, that it would be another individual agreed by those parties uh, that would take it. And there's a party called the Alliance Party, which does not designate itself either as nationalist or as unionist, uh, who took, who took that, uh, that job. Um, there are, I have to say, problems which remain. 50-50 um, recruitment, recruitment was in for a period of 10 years, and then it was uh, done away with. And I think that was a mistake, uh, because it, it, is, it, it is still quite hard, because of the, the legacy, because of the history, uh, to bring nationalists into it. So you have to have some process which allows that to happen. But however, that's, that's where we are at the moment. Recently, <coughs> excuse me, to give an example of the power of the policing board, we discovered that in the training of the new police officers, that uh, a militaristic approach, because it used to be a militaristic approach, but a militaristic approach had re-emerged in the training of uh, police officers. We found this out through a process of, uh, there was uh, a whistleblower who said that there was cheating during the exams. So we demanded that there needed to be a review. Actually, we brought in uh, someone from Police Scotland uh, an outsider to investigate that and uh, there are now huge changes being made to that. Uh, uh, so so you, you always have to be vigilant in, in terms of all of these things. There was a retire rehire scandal. So one of the effects, <coughs> excuse me, of uh, a green policing was a lot of the, if you like, the old guard started to move out of the organisation. They got very, and there was a great incentive, they got very... Uh, very good uh, redundancy packages to encourage them to leave because we needed, a, we needed to change the critical mass. We needed to make room for new recruits coming in to change the ethos, to change the culture, to change the conflict culture uh, because if you are having a police service in a trans, uh, transitional period or in a post-conflict period, uh, then you need to try and uh, it's hard to change the mentality of people, and I say this on both sides, not just on the government side, but on both sides. It's hard to change that military attitude, so you have to have some sort of critical, critical mass. Uh, you can have, I, I used to be accused by the, the British quite a lot of, of uh, being almost uh, obsessive about legislation during this period that we needed the legislation, and, and my answer to them was very simple. 
you know, I'm not obsessed with legislation. You can have the best legislation in the world, but if there is not the will to implement it, then it is of no great value. However, if you do not have the legislation, then you do not even have the structure upon which to make the change. So, which is why we were so adamant about the legislation reflecting uh, the recommendations we had. Within policing, even till this day, and it's, uh, sometimes I have to remind our own activists that uh, we, we have uh, a police service, there used to be a huge police service, over 12,000 along with the British Army, which, which brought it up at one stage to 31,000, but we have a police service now of something like 6,800, just over that. And of that, 4,000 of them were never in the RUC. So if you talk about critical mass, you talk about the period that has passed, you can see that the changes come, sometimes gradually, uh, but they can come in terms of uh, all of that. Um, the issue of legacy uh, is, is also a huge issue. And because of the legacy of police, because they were, even up till today, there, there was a resistance to hand over information about legacy inquests. There's some inquests which have never taken place in the north of Ireland over a period of 45 years. And only now are we getting the grips with able to get that forward. And there is still a resistance to give information to those inquests. So you can see that the problems can travel on, uh, but but the, the difference that has been made is huge. Yeah. Uh, confidence. Uh, and, and it all comes back, and I'll, I'll finish uh, uh, now. It all comes back to a very basic question, because you've all been through conflicts. In any society, do you or do you not need policing? And if the answer is that you need policing. And during the conflict in many areas, you know, the IRA would have taken on uh, rough justice. And, and frankly, and I say this as a Republican, it never worked. Because they were not, they, they were not made to be police officers. And uh, if you believe that, that there needs to be policing, then in any transitional or post-conflict situation, then you have to come to the terms, which is, which is quite difficult, by the way, you have to come to terms with that, and the population, the base, also has to come to terms. If if they believe that you know there is justice, that there has to be justice, that there has to be policing, then to get it right is a huge uh, a huge challenge. But I would say, in terms of all of that, I think we have come a massive distance in in terms of what we had uh, you know 20 years ago and where we are today. I would say that you, you have to be continuously vigilant, and to be continuously vigilant, then you need the structures to do that, which is why the accountability mechanisms uh, are so, uh, are so uh, basic to that. Um, and I, I'll finish with that, sorry for going on so long, but if anybody wants to ask questions or make comments or whatever. Thank you.